Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics past question question one. In the collision between two objects, kinetic energy is conserved only if a one of the objects was initially at rest, b potential energy is converted to work, c the collision is inelastic, and d the collision is elastic. So the question says, in a collision between two objects, kinetic energy is converted only if now, when there's a collision between two objects, there are two words, two forms of this collision. It's either the collision is what? It's an elastic collision, an elastic collision or an inelastic collision. Now, for an elastic collision, for an elastic collision, the total kinetic energy the total kinetic energy is the same is the same before and after the collision before and after the collision that is both momentum and kinetic energy is conserved so in an elastic collision or what you refer to as a perfect elastic collision the kinetic energy and the momentum of the bodies involved in this collision is actually what's constant that is it is conserved before and after the collision so both momentum both momentum and kinetic energy and kinetic energy ke is conserved is conserved now in an inelastic collision inelastic collision in an inelastic collision only the momentum only momentum is conserved only momentum is conserved now the kinetic energy ke decreases after collision for an inelastic what, collision so in an inelastic collision only the momentum is conserved but the kinetic energy now does what decreases after collision now the question says in an in a collision between two objects kinetic energy is conserved only if the collision is what an elastic collision because in an elastic collision both momentum and the kinetic energy is conserved the total kinetic energy before and after the collision remains the same so the answer to this question is option d the collision is elastic. Thank you very much. And you subscribe to our channel for more videos. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics pass question question 2. The quantity of motion of a body is its A acceleration. B displacement, C momentum, and D velocity. The question says the quantity of motion of a body is its. Now let's briefly describe each of these. A says acceleration. Now acceleration is simply defined as the rate, the rate of change of velocity. The rate of change of velocity that is acceleration a is giving us velocity all over time so the rate of change of velocity and that is acceleration now b says displacement now displacement is simply what the distance covered distance covered with specified direction specified direction now displacement is similar to what distance but the only difference is that displacement is a vector quantity while distance is a scalar quantity and so displacement has to do with what direction now c says momentum now momentum is simply defined as the words the product of mass and velocity of an object the product of mass and velocity of an object Thus, it increases with what? With increase in the object's mass and the velocity. Now, we can therefore say that what? 
momentum is the quantity of motion of a body we can therefore say does that what it is the quantity it is the quantity of motion of a body because what it is giving us the products of the mass and velocity that is momentum let's see m is giving us what mass times velocity mass times velocity the mass of the body times the velocity of this body so therefore this what sum of the quantity of motion in that body motion being the velocity and the quantity being the mass so the quantity of motion of a body is what is the momentum now this is velocity velocity simply means what the rate of change of distance with time rate of change rate of change of displacement with time of displacement with time that means displacement and velocity v is equal to what displacement all over time so the answer to this question is option c momentum that is the quantity of motion of a body that which is given as the product of mass and the velocity of that body thank you please ensure to subscribe to the channel for more videos hello good day and welcome i'll be answering the waski 2020 physics pass question question 3 the volume of a fixed mass of gas varies inversely as the pressure on it, provided the temperature is constant. The statement is A. Pressure law B. Charles law C. Boyce law and D. General gas law Now the question says the volume of a fixed mass of gas varies inversely as the pressure on it, provided the temperature is constant. That this statement is which law? Now let's just quickly pick each of these law and what we'll look at how they are stated. Now pressure law. Now pressure law states that the pressure of a fixed mass of gas of a fixed mass of gas at constant volume at constant volume constant volume is proportional to the absolute temperature of the gas is proportional to the absolute temperature of the gas now this is what the pressure law stated by gelusax now this is charles law now charles law states that the volume of a fixed mass of gas volume of a fixed mass of gas increases by increases by 1 all over 273 of its volume at 0 degree celsius per degree rise in temperature provided its pressure remains constant provided its pressure remains constant now this is what this is charles law stated by charles now option c says what boy's law now boy's law is stated as the pressure of a fixed mass of gas is inversely proportional is inversely proportional to its volume provided that the temperature is kept constant provided temperature is kept constant so that is what boys law now this is general gas law now the general gas law is the combination of boys law 
a combination of boy slow and child slow. That is the general gas law. So general gas law is a combination of what? The boy slow and child slow. Now the question says the volume of a fixed mass of gas varies inversely as the pressure on it. And I said boy slow state that the pressure of a fixed mass of gas varies inversely as its volume. Now it is the same thing as this saying was the volume of a fixed mass of gas varies inversely as the pressure. So therefore, this statement is actually what a statement of Boyce's law, because the volume of a fixed mass of gas varies inversely as the pressure. That is, when you have the volume increasing, the pressure what decreases. Increase in volume will lead to a decrease in the pressure, and increase in pressure will lead to a what a decrease in the volume. That is what that is Boyce's law, because it is what. The volume is inversely proportional to the pressure, and this law is Boyce's law, option C. Thank you, and sure to subscribe to the channel for more videos. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 Physics Past Question, Question 4. An image formed on a screen is always A inverted, B magnified, C upright, and D virtual. So, now an image formed on a screen is always a what? A real image. Is a real what? Image. Any image that can be caught on a screen. Image that can be caught. Or formed on a screen is a real image now real images are real images are always what's inverted remember we have two types of image we have the real image and the what virtual image so real images are always inverted they're always inverted now for the virtual image, the virtual image cannot be caught on the screen, that is they cannot be formed on the screen. They cannot be formed on the screen. So the answer to this question is what? Option A. Because images formed on the screen are real images and real images are always what? Inverted. So the answer to this question is what? Option A. Inverted. Thank you, God bless you, and just subscribe to our channel for more videos. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 Physics Pass question, question 5. How would capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor be affected if the distance of separation of its plates is decreased? It will A increase in value, B decrease slightly, C remain unchanged, and D drop to zero. Now we are asked to describe how the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor will be affected if the distance of separation between its plates is decreased. Now the capacitance of a capacitor that's a parallel plate capacitor is inversely proportional it's inversely proportional to the distance of separation between the plates of this capacitor and this can be seen in the relation where you have capacitance C is equal to the constant multiplied by the area all over the distance of separation now you see that what well, this capacitance is inversely proportional to what to the distance that is C the capacitance is inversely proportional to the distance of separation between what this plates now because of this inverse proportion when there's an increase in the distance that is when you have an increase in the distance of separation between these plates you have a what a decrease in capacitance but when there's a decrease in distance between the plates of this capacitor there will be a what there will be an increase in the capacitance 
Now the question says, how would the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor be affected if the distance of separation is decreased? Now when the distance of separation is decreased, due to the inverse proportion, the capacitance will do what? Will increase. The capacitance will increase. And this is option A. So it will increase in value. Thank you and you should subscribe to the channel for more videos. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 Physics Pass Question Question 6. Which of the following machines does not apply the lever principle? A. Claw hammer, B. Wheelbarrow, C. Single pulley, and D. Sugar tongue. As we know, machines are sword, <coughs> machines are equipment that are used to what, overcome large resistance by applying small or simple what, efforts. Now, a lever is a type of machine, and this lever what, covers several what, equipment or tools that makes use of this what, principle, the lever principle. Now, this lever principle enables large resistance to be overcome with little force. And in terms of the lever principle, a lever has what we call a fulcrum. A fulcrum. Let's say, for instance, this is a simple word representation of a lever. Now, this point here is what we call what the fulcrum. We call this the fulcrum or pivot. Then now, where the effort is applied, let's assume effort is applied here. We call this part the what the effort E. And where the load is applied or where the load is placed, we call it what? We call it the load L. Now this lever principle has what? Work on three forms. We have the what? We have the first order lever, the second order lever, and the third order lever. So the first order lever, the second order lever, and the third other lever and this is actually what's based on the position of the three main parts of a lever that is the effort the fulcrum and the load but now the question says which of the following machines does not apply the principle of lever that is lever principle now the examples of machines that apply what the lever principle includes let me list them for us we have the scissors we have the scissors the scissors what the scissors applies the lever principle and that is the first order principle the first order principle also we have the claw hammer the claw hammer also the first order principle or the first order um, lever we have the wheelbarrow we have the sugar tongue forceps and so on now the question says which of the following machine does not apply the lever principle now you can see claw hammer applies the lever principle likewise the wheelbarrow and the sugar tongue but option c here says what single pulley now a pulley or a pulley system is a type of machine it's another type of machine that do not apply what the lever principle this um this pulley system is usually used to what it's usually used to raise or lower heavy loads used to raise lower or heavy loads now a pulley is described like this let me give you a diagrammatic representation of a pulley take for instance you have something like this where it is attached then you have it like this now the effort is applied here the effort is usually applied here and then the load is what will be suspended on this pulley system like this here will be the load so now the effort being applied here what will enable what you to leave this load so this is a representation of what a pulley system you can see that this pulley system is different from the lever principle this other machines here apply the word lever principle except option C which is single pulley so option C is the answer to this question thank you and God bless you and should subscribe to the channel for more videos
Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering WASCII 2020 physics past question, question 7. The average distance moved by a molecule between collisions is called A. Molecular distance, B. Intermolecular distance, C. Mean distance, and D. Mean free path. Now, let's be analyze each of these options to get out our answer. Now, molecular distance, that's option A. Molecular distance is simply what the distance. This is distance between atoms of the same molecule that is atoms of the same molecule the distance between atoms of the same molecule is what we call the molecular distance now this is intermolecular distance this is the distance between different what molecules or two molecules now mean distance this is the average distance between molecules of any element now mean free parts mean free parts is the average mean free parts is the average distance traveled by a moving particle this particle can be an atom, it can be a molecule between successive what collision between successive collision. So mean free part is the what average distance moved by what or traveled by a moving particle between successive collision. And the question says the average distance moved by molecule between collisions is called D mean free parts this is the answer to the question mean free parts thank you and god bless you and should subscribe to the channel for more videos hello good day and welcome i will be answering waski 2020 physics past question question eight which of the following requires material medium for its propagation a radio wave b light wave c sound wave and d x-ray now we are asked to pick an option which is a wave or a type of wave that requires material medium for its propagation now like we know we have two types of waves based on the what need for a material medium for propagation and this is the mechanical wave the mechanical wave and the electromagnetic wave electromagnetic wave now the mechanical wave the mechanical wave are waves that requires material medium for propagation that is this type of wave cannot be propagated in a vacuum and example of a mechanical wave include the sound wave the sound wave we have the water wave and so on now electromagnetic wave on the other hand are waves that do not require material medium they do not require what material medium for propagation. An example of this wave are the radio wave, e.g., we have the radio wave, the we have the X ray, light wave, and so on. Now, this electromagnetic wave can be propagated in a vacuum. You know, a vacuum is an empty space. Now, mechanical waves, like I said, requires material medium for their propagation. And the question is asking us about what mechanical wave. And an example of mechanical wave is what sound wave, which is option C. So therefore, sound wave is the answer to this question because sound wave is a mechanical wave which requires material medium for its propagation. The other options here are electromagnetic waves that do not require medium, material medium for propagation. And this sound wave requires what material medium. The denser the medium, 
the faster it was speed of propagation so the answer to this question is what option c sound waves thank you and god bless you and should subscribe to the channel for more videos Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics past question, question 9. The depolarizing agent in a Leclanche cell is A. Carbon rod, B. Ammonium chloride, C. Manganese 4 oxide, and D. Zinc plates. Now, a Leclanche cell is a, what, is a type of wet, is a type of wet cell. Although we have the wet and dry Leclanche cell, but the Leclanche cell actually described here is the word wet Leclanche cell now this Leclanche cell has various components that is its positive terminal its negative terminal the depolarizing agents and the electrolytes but the question is asking us to identify the depolarizing agents in the Leclanche cell now in the Leclanche cell the positive terminal the positive terminal is the carbon rod and that is option A. Now the negative terminal, the negative terminal is the word zinc plates, and that is option D. Now the electrolytes, the electrolytes is what is the ammonium chloride, is the ammonium chloride, and that is option B. And now the depolarizing agents, depolarizing agents is the manganese 4 oxide. Manganese 4 oxide. And that is option C. So manganese 4 oxide is the depolarizing agent in a Leclanche cell. Thank you and God bless you. And sure subscribe to the channel for more videos. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics past question, question 10. The material used to slow down the neutrons in a nuclear reactor is A. Boron, B. Copper, C. Graphite, and D. Uranium. So we're asked to pick an option which is the material used to slow down nuclear reactors. Now, materials used to slow down nuclear reactors are what we call them moderators of nuclear reactors any material that is used to slow down nuclear neutrons in a nuclear reactor are called what moderators we call them the moderators of nuclear reactors they have to slow down the neutrons in some other terms you can call them what cooler so they are moderators of nuclear reactor that slows down what slows down neutrons now an example of a material that is used to slow down neutron is the uranium uranium is a what's a typical example of a material used to slow down neutrons in the nuclear reactor so uranium is known as a moderator of nuclear reactors and that is option d uranium which is the answer to this question thank you and god bless you and just subscribe to the channel for more videos Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics pass question, question 11. Which of the following statements explains why hot soapy water is more effective in cleaning oil stained dishes? A. The oil on the dishes repels the soap. B. Soap and heat decreases the surface tension of water. C. Hot water increases the surface tension of oil. And D. Soap increases the surface tension of oil and water. Now, we know or we observe that most of our dishes or oil stained dishes are usually washed with what with either soapy water or hot soapy water now this is because hot soapy water helps to what to reduce it reduces surface tension hot soapy water helps to reduce the surface tension of water 
and by doing this by reducing the surface tension of water it enables what enables the oil particles that is the oil particles on these dishes to what to float away thereby cleaning our dishes so this reduction of the surface water um, tension of the water enables what enables the water to wet these dishes now when the water is able to wet these dishes it then what it then floats away the oil particles the oil particles from the dishes from the dishes and like we know we know that what heat and soap or detergent heat and soap or detergent helps to what helps to lower the surface tension of water and that is why hot soapy water is very what important in cleaning oil stained dishes like i said it will what it will reduce the surface tension of this water making the water able to what to wet the dishes now when this water wets dishes it will now be have the ability to what to float away the oil particles on these dishes and like you know surface tension is the force acting on the surface of water making it to behave like a stretch elastic skin so when this surface tension is reduced by the heat or the soap that is the hot soapy water what happens it enables it to float away these oil particles from the dishes thereby cleaning our dishes so therefore the answer to this question is option b because soap and heat decreases the surface tension of water so option b is the correct answer to this question thank you and god bless you and share subscribe to our channel for more videos Wasky 2020 physics pass question question 13. An electrical device has 50 tons in its primary coil and 20 tons in the secondary coil. The device can be A or an A step up transformer, B step down transformer, C DC generator, and D AC generator. Now, an electric device with a primary coil and a secondary coil is typically what a transformer is a transformer now a transformer is a device or an electrical device used for changing used for changing the size of an alternating current voltage that's an AC voltage so in other words it acts to increase or decrease the EMF that is the electromotive force of an alternating current now there are two types of transformer we have two types of transformer we have the step up transformer step up transformer and then we have the words the step down transformer step down transformer now for the step up transformer it helps to what it helps to increase it helps to increase or step up the applied voltage or primary voltage and this is actually done because the secondary coil of a step up transformer has more tons than the what than the primary coil so when you see a step up transformer that is used to what step up or increase the primary voltage of an alternating current the secondary coil always has what more tons than the primary coil in the sense that let's take for instance you have 20 tons in the primary coil the secondary coil will have what more than 20 tons it might have 50 or 100 tons because what you are trying to increase the primary voltage but in terms of the step down transformer you're trying to what decrease the primary voltage you're trying to decrease the primary what voltage or step down the primary voltage or applied voltage and because of that the primary tone and uh, coil usually have more tone than the what than the secondary coil that is the secondary coil has less tones compared to the primary what primary coil because you're trying to what step down or decrease the applied voltage or primary voltage now the question says an electrical device has 50 tons in its primary coil and 20 tons in secondary coil now you agree with me that here now the primary coil has more tons than the secondary coil and so therefore it is a what a step down transformer because the main aim here is to what, decrease the applied voltage here and like we say they say the step down transformer helps to decrease primary voltage or applied voltage and this is because the primary coil usually have more tons than the secondary coil unlike the step up transformer that's the 
secondary coil has more tons than the primary watt coil so the answer to this question is what option b step down transformer now we didn't look at generators dc generator or ac generator this is because generator is a device that does what that actually is used to convert magnetic energy towards to electrical energy so it works on the principle of electromagnetism whereby magnetic what energy is used to produce what electricity that's in terms of the generator so magnetic energy is used to produce electricity but the device that we have been described here is the what is a transformer and that is the step down transformer which is option b thank you and god bless you and sure subscribe to our channel for more videos Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering WASCI 2020 physics past question, question 14. The earpiece of a telephone handset converts energy from dash to dash. A from electrical to sound, B from sound to electrical, C from radio wave to sound, and D from sound to radio wave. Now, the earpiece of a telephone works on the principle of what electromagnetism. It works on the principle of electromagnetism. Now, the telephone earpiece is a device. It's a device which converts, which converts the varying electric energy from the microphone. That is, it receives electric energy from the microphone and converts it into what varying sound energy in other words the telephone earpiece is simple an electrical device that would converts electrical energy into sound energy now this electrical energy is actually received from what from a microphone and the microphone is also an electrical device that converts what sound energy into what into an electric energy so when you speak to a microphone this sound energy will be picked by this microphone and then converted to electrical energy now this electrical energy from the microphone will be sent to the what to the telephone earpiece which then convert this electrical energy into what sound energy that enable us to what to hear the sounds or the vibrations so the answer to this question is what option a electrical energy towards to sound energy thank you and god bless you and sure subscribe to the channel for more videos Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering WASCI 2020 physics past question question 16. A ray of light traveling from glass into ethyl alcohol is incident at the boundary at an angle of incidence 30 degree. Calculate the angle of refraction. Now, given that the refractive index of glass is equal to 1.5 and the refractive index of ethyl alcohol is equal to 1.36 now we are asked to find the word to calculate the angle of refraction the angle of refraction now for us to calculate the angle of refraction we must know the word the refractive index of this boundary where the word where the light or this light ray actually crosses remember the angle of the refractive index for glass that is of the light moving from air to glass is 1.5 and the refractive index of light moving from air to ethyl alcohol is 1.36 now we'll have to find the refractive index of what the light moving from glass to alcohol and this is giving us refractive index from what from glass to what ethyl alcohol and this is equal to the refractive index of glass all over refractive index of ethyl alcohol and this is equal to 1.5 all over 1.36 and we'll have what 
1.103. Now this is the refractive index of the light rays moving from glass to retail alcohol. Now we can now see the refractive index of the light moving from glass to ethyl alcohol is equal to sine angle of incidence all over sine angle of what refraction now we can now see 1.103 is equal to sine 30 all over sine r remember i have to find what r now from here we can see what sine r that sine, sine angle of refraction is equal to sine 30 degree sine 30 degree all over the refractive index of light moving from glass to ethyl alcohol and that is 1.103 and sine 30 degree will give us what will give us 0.5 now all over 1.0103 now to find r we simply would take the what the sine inverse of this so we now say r is equal to what sine inverse of 0 0.5 all over 1.103 and this will give us 27 degree that's approximately what 27 degree now when you take the sine inverse of 0 0.5 all over 1.103 in your calculator when you point this on your calculator you get what 26.9 something and so approximately that is what 27.0 what degree and that is option a 27 degree so this is the what angle of refraction thank you and god bless you and sure subscribe to our channel for more videos Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics pass question, question 17. A 60 kg man stands on a wind balance in an elevator. If the elevator accelerates upward at 5 meters per second square, determine the reading of the scale. A 300 Newton, B 600 Newton, C 800 Newton, and D 900 Newton. Now, the man has a mass M of 60 kg. Now he's he stands on a wing balance that is he's trying to check his weight on a wing balance but now inside an elevator and this elevator is accelerating upwards at what five meter per second square now accelerating upward against what against gravity is going what against gravity because it's moving what upward accelerating upward is against gravity and the what acceleration due to gravity g is equal to 10 meter per second square now to find the width of this man that is the which is the reading of the skill that is the wind balance we must what subtract this what acceleration of the elevator from the acceleration due to gravity because the man is moving what against gravity so therefore the weight of the man or the reading of the skill is equals to the mass multiplied by what acceleration due to gravity minus the what acceleration of the elevator and this is equals to 60 multiplied by 10 minus 5 and this is equal to 60 multiplied by 5 which is equals to 300 newton so the weight of this man is 300 newton and that is option a thank you and god bless you and sure subscribe to our channel for more videos Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics past question, question 18. The length of an iron bar is 100 cm at 20 degrees Celsius. At what temperature will its length increase it by 0.01%? Now, given that the linear expansivity of iron is equal to 1.2 times 10 raised to the power of minus 5 degree, that's per degree Celsius, a 48 degree celsius b 38 degree celsius c 28.3 degree celsius and d 23 degree celsius so we have to find what the temperature at which its length will 
increased by 0.01%. Now the formula for finding the formula for finding the linear expansivity of a given ion or a given what metal is given as alpha is equals to L2 minus L1 all over L1 into theta 2 minus theta 1 that is change in temperature now this L2 minus L1 is what the increase in length and that can be represented as what E increase in length is equals to L2 minus L1 so we can therefore see that alpha is equals to E all over L1 into theta 2 minus theta 1 remember I say L1 is what um, E is the increase in length that is L2 minus L1 and we are given that the increase in length is what is by 0.01 percent so therefore e is equal to 0.01 all over 100 multiplied by what 100 which is what l1 so we are trying to what get the increase in length now the initial length is what is 10 100 centimeter so to get the increase in length since this is 0.01 percent of this which is 0.01 over 100 multiplied by 100. Now this 100 we cancel this 100. So we have that increase in length is equal to 0.01 centimeter. 0.01 centimeter. That is the increase in length. Now we have that L1 is equal to that's the initial length is 100 centimeter. Then we have that our first temperature, that is initial temperature, theta 1 is equal to 20 degrees Celsius, at which the length of this ion is 100 centimeter. Then we are asked to find the what the temperature at which what it will increase by 0.01 percent, and that is theta two. Now we have that the linear expansivity is equal to 1.2 times 10 raised power of minus 5 per degree Celsius. Now, from this formula here, from this given formula here, we can deduce that theta two, which is what we are asked to look for theta 2 is equal to the increase in length all over linear expansivity multiplied by the initial length plus the what initial temperature which is theta 1 from this formula because when you multiply both sides by this you saw in cross multiply this what this linear expansivity you multiply this leaving what you with e here on the right hand side now when you divide both sides by what the linear expansivity and the initial length you have what theta 2 minus theta 1 here equals to what e all over linear expansivity multiplied by the initial length then now adding the what initial temperature to both sides will now give you what this formula so this is the formula we're going to be using theta 2 is equals to increase in length e all over the alpha which is the linear expansivity multiplied by l1 which is the initial length plus theta 1 which is the initial temperature so we have that theta 2 is equal to now e the increase in length is 0 0.01 centimeter 0 0.01 all over now alpha linear expansivity 1.2 times 10 raised power of minus 5 multiplied by l1 which is 100 then everything plus theta 1 which is 20 now we we'll have that what theta 2 is equal to 8.3 plus 20 now when you carry this out this is 1.2 here when you carry this out this 0 0.01 all over 1.2 times 10 to the power minus 5 multiply by 100 it will give us what 8.3 now 8.3 plus 20 will give us what will be equals to 28.3 degree celsius and this is the temperature at which what the length will increase by 0.01 percent and that is option c 28.3 degree celsius thank you and god bless you and share subscribe to the channel for more videos hello good day and welcome i will be answering waski 2020 physics past question question 19 a moving coil galvanometer which gives a full scale deflection with 0 0.005 amperes is converted to a voltmeter reading up to 5 volts using an external resistance of 975 ohms 
what is the resistance of the meter that is the resistance of the galvanometer a 0 0.25 ohms b 2.5 ohms c 25 ohms and d 250 ohms so we are asked to find the resistance of the galvanometer now this is a conversion of a galvanometer to a voltmeter and like we know a galvanometer is an instrument that is used to measure very very small currents now it is given that the current that is being measured with full def scale deflection i is equals to 0 0.005 watts amperes now this galvanometer is converted to a voltmeter reading up to 5 volts that means the total voltage v is equals to what 5 volts using an external resistance of 975 ohms now in the conversion of a galvanometer to a voltmeter a multiplier which is an external resistance is actually what applied and that's resistance is known as what r2 and this is r2 is equals to 975 ohms now the initial what resistance or the internal resistance of the galvanometer is known as r1 which is what we are asked to look for now each of these resistance has its own voltage which sum up to give us this total voltage v so therefore we have v1 and we also have v2 so we have v1 which is not known and also v2 which is not known now v2 is the resistance of the what is the voltage of this external resistance why v1 is the voltage of the what of the galvanometer that is the internal resistance now let's find v2 v2 is equal to i times r2 and this is equal to 0 0.05 0 0.005 multiplied by 975 and this is equal to 4.875 voltage v so from this we can say what v which is the total voltage is equals to v1 plus v2 now since we have v which is 5 voltage and v2 which is 4.87 voltage we can find what v1 and v1 is equals to what v minus v2 which is equals to 5 minus 4.875 and this is equal to 0 0.125 voltage so v1 is equal to 0 0.125 volts now since we have v1 now to be equal to 0 0.125 volts we can now find what we can now find r1 because r1 is resistance of the galvanometer from v is equals to i times r1 that's v1 is equals to i times r1 we say r1 is equals to v1 all over i and this is equals to 0 0.125 all over 0 0.005 and this is equals to 25 ohms so 25 ohms is the resistance of the galvanometer and that is option c thank you and god bless you and sure subscribe to our channel for more videos Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering ASCII 2020 physics class question, question 20. A beam consisting of alpha particle, beta particle, and gamma rays pass through a magnetic field at right angles to the direction of the field. Which of the following observations were made about the alpha particle, beta particle, and gamma rays, respectively? A. Deflected, deflected, and deflected, meaning that the alpha ray will be deflected, beta ray will be deflected, and the gamma rays will be deflected. B says deflected, deflected, not deflected. C deflected, not deflected, deflected, and D not deflected, deflected, and deflected. Now this respectively here yes, simply means that what each of these options, like this force deflected here, stands for the alpha particle. This stands for the beta particle, and D stands for the what gamma rays. So that's what it means. Now, the question says a beam consisting of alpha particle, beta particle, and what gamma rays pass through a magnetic field at right angle to the direction of the field. Now, let's take for instance, we have a magnet, a bar magnet. This is a bar magnet producing the word magnetic field. And this is the north pole, and this is the south pole. And we have what? A radiation consisting of these three what particles that is the alpha particle, 
di gamma pasifku um, di beta pasifku and di gamma rays like this we have a what's relative element producing what this this um this rays or these particles now i want you to understand that the alpha particle is what positively charged alpha particle has a positive charge now the beta particle has what a negative charge is negatively what charged while the gamma rays is what is neutral the gamma ray is neutral it has no what no charge at all now like we know when a positively charged particle goes into what a magnetic field it will be deflected towards the what to the south pole likewise when the negatively charged particle goes into what a magnetic field it will be deflected towards the what towards the north pole so therefore because of this we'll have that what the alpha particle will be deflected towards the, the beta particle will be sorry since it's negatively charged will be deflected towards the what towards the north pole now this is what the beta particle it's negatively what charged so it's deflected towards the north pole now the alpha particle, since it's positively charged, will be diverted towards the what? Towards the south pole. It is positively what? Charged. Now the gamma rays, which has no charge, will be neutral, will not be what? Deflected. So you can see now that what? The alpha particle will be deflected. The beta particle will be deflected. But the gamma rays will not be deflected. Will not be deflected. And this is what option B. This is option B. It is gamma particle, um, alpha particle deflected, beta particle deflected, and gamma rays not deflected because the gamma rays is neutral, it has no charge. So, therefore, the answer to this question is option B. Thank you and God bless you. And should subscribe to the channel for more videos. Good day and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics pass question question 21. A parallel plate capacitor is charged and the charging battery subsequently disconnected. If the plates of the capacitor are moved further apart by means of insulin handles known as the dielectric substance, the dash A capacitance would increase, B capacitance would decrease, C charge on the capacitor would increase, and D charge on the capacitor would decrease. Now, we like we know, the capacitance of a capacitor is what is inversely inversely proportional to the distance to the distance between the plates to the distance between the plates. That is to say that the capacitance c is inversely what proportional to the word distance between the plates and this is derived from the formula c is equals to permissivity of free space multiplied by the area all over what the distance now this d stands for the what distance between the plates of a parallel plate capacitor and like you can see you see that capacitance is inversely proportional to this word distance so therefore increasing the distance between the plates of this capacitor will lead towards a decrease in capacitance and vice versa now the question says if the plates of the capacitor are moved further apart simply that's meaning that if this is a plate and this is a plate and this is distance between them now if these two plates are moved further that they are moved further apart now you see that was the distance d has increased and increasing this distance between the plates has or will lead towards a decrease in the capacitance of this capacitor and that is option b the capacitance will decrease so option b is the answer to this question thank you and god bless you ensure you subscribe to the channel for more videos Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics pass question, question 22. The velocity of sound in air at 15 degrees Celsius is 340 meters per second. 
calculate the velocity at 47 degrees celsius a 790 meter per second b 602 meter per second c 358 meter per second and d 322 meter per second now the relationship between the velocity of sound in air and the temperature is giving us v1 is equal to or v1 over v2 is equal to square root of theta 1 all over square root of theta 2 this theta here is then the temperature that is the velocity of sound in air is directly proportional to the square root of the temperature now we're given that v1 is 340 meter per second and v2 is what we are looking for the unknown now the initial temperature is 15 degree Celsius and the final temperature that's theta 2 is equal to 47 degrees Celsius then we are asked to find the velocity as this 47 degrees Celsius so therefore we have that V1 which is 340 all over V2 which is the unknown is equal to the square root of 15 all over square root of 47 now from this we can see V2 is equal to 340 multiplied by the square root of 47 all over square root of 15 and calculating this we have that V2 is equal to or approximately 602 meter per second 602 meter per second and that is option B Thank you and God bless you and share subscribe to our channel for more videos. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics pass question, question 23. Which of the current voltage characteristics shown below is exhibited by an ohmic conductor? which of the current voltage characteristics shown below is exhibited is that exhibited by an ohmic conductor now we're given the following graphs and we have to pick what's one of the graphs that exhibits the, the characteristics of the current voltage of an ohmic conductor now an ohmic conductor an ohmic conductor is simply a conductor that was that obeys ohm's law a conductor which obeys Ohm's law. It obeys Ohm's law. And like we know, Ohm's law states that the current flowing through a metallic conductor that is like wire or a metal is directly proportional to the potential difference across the ends, provided that temperature and pressure are kept constant. Now, it says that what the current flowing through a metallic conductor is directly proportional to what to the potential difference that's the voltage now this is ohm's law and so therefore we have that what we have that v over i is equal to constant and so therefore we say v over i is equal to the what to the resistance now this is ohm's law now in the graph now we are giving a graph of what current against voltage meaning i against what against v and now this is the inverse of what this is the inverse of resistance we can call it resistance inverse now this i over v we still carry the same relationship as what as v over i which is equal to what resistance now i over v is just like what just changing it like finding the reciprocal of r but that relationship will still be what will still be maintained that is that's direct relationship will be maintained because it is seen that what the current from ohm's law is directly proportional to the voltage so therefore increase in current will lead to what an increase in voltage an increase in voltage will lead to increase in current and so therefore the graph that can be represented as this will be given like this if you have the current i against voltage now since they are directly proportional to each other whenever there's an increase in current there will also be an increase in voltage and this is option b so option b is the correct what illustration of the characteristics of a current voltage exhibited by an ohmic conductor so option b 
is the correct answer to this question. Thank you and sure to subscribe to our channel for more videos. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering WASCI 2020 physics pass question, question 24. A 500 Newton box rests on a horizontal floor. A constant horizontal force is exerted on the box so that it moves through its meters. If the coefficient of kinetic friction between the floor and the box is 0.22, calculate the work done on the box. A. 880 joules. B. 440 joules. C 400 joules and D 110 joules. So we are asked to find what the work done. That is the work done in moving this box through a distance of 8 meters. Now for us to find the work done, we have to find the force. Now the question says a 500 newton box. Now this is the weight of the box. That is the reaction acting on this box which is the weight. Now let's assume this is this is the horizontal floor. And then the box is lying on this horizontal floor. Let's assume this is the box. And the weight of the box, that is the force acting downward on the weight of the box is what? Is 500 Newton. That is R, the reaction acting on the box is 500 watts Newton. Now, a constant horizontal force, F, a constant horizontal force, let's call this force F, that is required to move this box against what? Friction. Is applied to move the box through what? through eight meters. So the distance d is equal to eight meters. Now, if the coefficient of kinetic friction, the coefficient of kinetic friction is called mu, is equal to 0 0.22. Now, calculate the work done on the box. And like we know, we know that what work w is equal to force times distance. Now we have distance, but we don't have force. Now to find our force, there is a formula that is co connecting the coefficient of kinetic friction with force and reaction. And this formula says that the coefficient of kinetic friction mu is equal to force all over reaction, which is the same as the weight of the box. And so we have that mu is 0 0.22. So we say 0 0.22 is equal to F all over 500. So F is equal to 500 multiply by 0 0.22 and f is equal to 110 newton 110 newton so this is the horizontal force now to find the work done work done w is equal to force times distance and this is equal to 110 newton multiplied by 8 and w the work done is equal to 880 joules and that is option a. So the work done is 880 joules. Thank you and God bless you. And sure to subscribe to our channel for more videos. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering WASCI 2020 physics pass question, question 25. A diagram above, that is this diagram above. Illustrate a ball of mass M sliding down a plank inclined at an angle theta to the horizontal. The kinetic friction between the ball and the plank is F, which is shown, and the acceleration of free fall is G, that's acceleration due to gravity. The normal force on the ball is A, Mg sin theta, B, Mg tan theta, C, Mg cos theta, and D, Mg cot theta. So we're giving an inclined plane let's draw an inclined plane we're given an inclined plane and then a ball is illustrated on this inclined plane let's assume this is a ball now there's a force acting on this ball we call this force was the frictional force which is given as f as the kinetic friction now there are various forces acting on this first of all we have the what we have the net force let's call this ft acting here also we have what we have the normal reaction that is the normal force we have the normal reaction that's the vertical components 
now this vertical component let's call it f n that is normal reaction normal force is acting was downward and upward this is a normal reaction then also now we now have the words the weights acting downward also and the weight is what giving us m g and remember it is inclined towards angle theta now to find the normal reaction or the normal force this is normal force fn the normal force is what is the horizontal component acting that is the horizontal component of the force acting on this what on this ball on this inclined plane and this horizontal component is giving us mg that is the weight of this ball multiplied by what cos theta but for the horizontal component which is ft it is giving us mg sine theta this is the horizontal component and the normal force is the what is the vertical component which is mg cos theta so fn is the what is normal force acting on the ball and that is option c mg cos theta is the answer to this question thank you and god bless you and just subscribe to the channel for more videos Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics pass question, question 27. What factors determine the frequency of a note emitted by vibrating string? A. The amplitude of vibration, force constant of string and length of string. B. Amplitude of vibration, force constant of string and tension in string. C. Mass per unit length of string, tension in string and length of string. And D. Force constant of string tension in string and length of string so the question says which what factors determine the frequency of a note emitted by vibrating string now the frequency of a note emitted by vibrating and sp uh, string f is giving us 1 all over 2l that's 2 times the length multiplied by the square root of the tension in the string all over the mass per unit length now this is the formula for finding the words the frequency of a note emitted by a vibrating string now from here you will see that what this frequency actually depends on the words it depends one on the length of the string length of string two the tension in the string tension in string which is the t the length of the string is l tension of the string is t and also the mass per unit length which is what which is m the mass per unit length and this is what m and this is the formula for finding the word the frequency of a note emitted by vibrating string this is the l this is the tension and this is what mass per unit length so we have that f frequency is equal to one all over two l multiplied by the square root of the tension all over the mass per unit length now from this you agree with me that what option c is the correct answer to this question because option c says mass per unit length which is this tension in string which is this and length of string which is this so the correct answer to this question is option c thank you and god bless you and sure subscribe to our channel for more videos Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics pass question, question 28. The magnitude of the force experienced by a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 8 coulomb in a uniform electric field of intensity 5 times 10 to the power of 5 newton per coulomb is a 3.2 times 10 to the power of minus 14 newton, b 8.0 times 10 to the power of minus 3 newton, c 8.0 times 10 to the power of 3 newton, and d 3.1 times 10 to the power of 13 newton. So we have to find the words the magnitude of the force that is experienced by a charge in a uniform electric field of what intensity 5 times 10 to the power 5 newton per coulomb now electric field intensity e electric field intensity e is giving us the force experienced by a charge all over the quantity 
of this charge q so this is the force this is the quantity of charge and this is the electric field what intensity now we are giving what e to be equal to 5 times 10 raised power of 5 newton per coulomb and q the quantity of charge to be equal to 1.6 times 10 raised power of minus 8 coulomb now we are asked to find what the force experienced by this charge so therefore from this from this formula here we can say f is equal to the electric field intensity multiplied by the quantity of charge and so f is equal to 5 times 10 raised power of 5 multiplied by 1.6 times 10 raised power of minus 8 so we have that f is equal to 5 times 1.6 multiplied by 10 raised power of 5 minus 8 and so f is equal to 8.0 multiplied by 10 raised power of minus 3 newton and that is option b option b 8.0 times 10 raised power of minus 3 newton so this is the answer to this question this is the force experienced by the charge in this uniform what electric field thank you and god bless you and should subscribe to our channel for more videos Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics past question, question 29. Which of the following statements about viscosity is not true? It's A depends on the area of the surface in contact, B occurs in fluids, C is independent of relative velocity of the layers, and D depends on the tangential force between the layers. So we have to pick a statement which is not true about viscosity. Now, what is viscosity? Viscosity Viscosity simply refers to Viscosity is the internal the internal friction between layers the internal friction between layers of liquid or gas in motion so viscosity is also what a frictional force but now viscosity is a frictional force in what in fluid it is a what is a force that acts in fluid that's why you call it the internal friction between what layers of liquid or gas and like we know liquid or gases constitute what are made of are fluids now option a says viscosity depends on the area of the surface in contact yes unlike frictional force Frictional force do not depend on the area of the surface in contact, but viscosity actually what depends on the area of the what, of these fluids. It depends on the area of the surface in contact, that is the layers in contact. The areas of these um, layers in contact is actually what's important in terms of viscosity. And it occurs in fluids, making option B valid. Then C says it's independent of the relative velocity of the layers. Now this is wrong. Viscosity actually what depends on the relative velocity between the layers in contact. That is, the layers of these fluids in contact is actually what is actually important in terms of viscosity because their relative velocity actually affects viscosity. So viscosity depends. It depends on the relative velocity. On the relative velocity of layers now let me explain this if you have a viscous um, fluid like your engine oil now and you put a stone inside this engine oil you discover that this stone will what be will be going what down gradually little by little it won't be as when you put a stone inside what inside a less viscous fluid like water now the fo this stone moving downward is expressing what is expressing viscosity and now its velocity is relative to what to the to the what to the velocity of the layers of this fluid and so therefore viscosity depends on the relative velocity of the layers in contact so option this is depends on the tangential force between the layers yes it also depends on the tangential force between the layers now from this you see that the only force option here is option c which is not true 
and this makes out option C the answer to this question because the question says which of the following statements about viscosity is not true and option C is not true because viscosity is dependent of the relative velocity of the layers. Thank you and God bless you and just subscribe to the channel for more videos. Good day and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics past question, question 30. A motorcycle starting from rest is uniformly accelerated such that its velocity in 10 seconds is 72 km per hour. What is its acceleration? A. 108 meter per second. B. 86 meter per second square. C. 4 meter per second square. And D. 2 meters per second square. So we are asked what to find the acceleration and the question says the motorcycle starts from rest and it's uniformly what accelerated uniformly accelerated so that its velocity in 10 seconds is what 72 kilometers per hour now we're given that it's what starts from rest start from rest meaning the initial velocity u is equal to what zero then it's accelerated uniformly to such that it attained what a final velocity of 72 km per hour. So V, final velocity is equal to what? 72 km per hour. Now, the time taken, T, is equal to 10 seconds. Now, we are asked to find what? The acceleration. And now, we know that acceleration is equal to final velocity V minus initial velocity U all over what the time taking but now if you look at our options here our options are given in what meter per second but the velocity given to us here is given to us in kilometer per hour and also the time given to us is in seconds so therefore we have to convert this our final velocity from kilometer per hour towards to meter per second and in doing this we say v is equals to 72 since um, 1000 meters will give one kilometer we say what times 1000 all over now per hour we have that what per hour we have 60 minutes and in this in a minute we have what 60 seconds so we say what all over 60 times 60 and this is equals to 72,000 all over 3600 and from here we have that V final velocity is equal to 20 meter per second 20 meter per second now we've gotten what our final velocity in meter per second now we can continue so we have that a acceleration is equals to v minus u all over t and this is equals to final velocity 20 minus initial velocity 0 all over time taking 10 so therefore a is equals to 20 all over 10 and this is equals to 2 meter per second square so 2 meter per second square is the acceleration and that is option d Thank you and God bless you. And just subscribe to the channel for more videos. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics past question, question 31. The temperature of an object is raised by 120 degrees Celsius. The resulting increase in its absolute temperature is A. 50 Kelvin b 120 kelvin c 200 kelvin and d 393 kelvin now an absolute temperature t is given in terms of kelvin and this is expressed as 273 plus the value in degree watts celsius now we are giving a temperature rise of 120 degrees celsius so therefore the absolute temperature t which is given in kelvin will be equal to 273 plus 120 and the temperature T is equal to 393 Kelvin. So this is what? This is the absolute temperature for the increase by 120 degree Celsius. But now it is given in what? Kelvin. And that is 393 Kelvin, which is option D. So this is the answer to the question. Thank you and God bless you. And to subscribe to our channel for more videos.
Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering WASCI 2020 physics past question, question 32. Which of the following statements about the motion of a simple pendulum is true? A. It is a simple harmonic motion when the angle of displacement is large. B. It passes the equilibrium position with minimum speed. C. It possesses maximum kinetic energy at the extreme position. And D. It swings faster at the pole than at the equator. So we are asked what? To pick an option which is true about the motion of a simple pendulum now i want you to know that a simple pendulum actually exhibits what a simple harmonic motion it exhibits a simple harmonic motion that's shm now it's this simple harmonic motion is actually what as a result of any displacement of what this simple pendulum it mustn't be what a large what angle of displacement the angle of displacement can either be large or small but once a pendulum is displaced by any angle it exhibits what it exhibits a simple harmonic motion for it to return to its what equilibrium position a simple pendulum do not return to its equilibrium position at once it undergoes what a simple harmonic motion that is a to and fro motion before it's what before it finally what gets to its equilibrium position now let me represent this motion diagrammatically let's say for instance we have a simple pendulum suspended like this like this now when displaced it will have an extreme position here and likewise an extreme position here now let me describe the motion like this So this is a diagrammatic representation. Now this is the what equilibrium position of this pendulum. Now when it is displaced, it undergoes what a to and fro movement, a simple harmonic what motion. Now at this point, at this point, the potential energy PE is what is maximum. The potential energy here is what maximum, and the kinetic energy is zero at this point why this is because the velocity at this point v is zero and likewise the same with this point but at this point while in the words in motion at this equilibrium point the kinetic energy here ke is what is maximum at this point and the what velocity here is minimum so therefore a simple pendulum when approaching the world its equilibrium position it approaches it with a what with a minimum velocity that is a minimum speed and at this equilibrium point the potential energy pe is what is zero pe is zero now let's look at the questions the options a says it is a simple harmonic motion when the angle of displacement is large no it is wrong it's it's a simple harmonic motion irrespective of what the angle of our displacement now B says it passes the equilibrium position with minimum speed. Yes, this is correct. Like what I described earlier, I said at this equilibrium position, kinetic energy is maximum. And while approaching the words, the equilibrium position, it passes it towards with minimum speed. Now C says it possesses maximum kinetic energy at the extreme position. No, this is the extreme position. And like I told you, I said at this extreme position, the velocity is zero. So therefore, kinetic energy is zero. But the potential energy here is what maximum so this is wrong and this is it swings faster at the pole than at the equator no at the pole what the velocity is zero but at the equator here the equilibrium position the velocity is what is minimum so it is also wrong now the only true answer here is option b it passes the equilibrium position with minimum speed and this is the answer to this question option b Thank you and God bless you. Ensure to subscribe to our channel. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering WASCI 2020 physics past question, question 34. Which of the following statements about photoelectrons is correct? A. A faint green light produces photoelectrons with less kinetic energy than a bright, bright red light. B. A red light releases a smaller number of electrons than a green light. C. A faint green light produces photoelectrons with greater kinetic energy than a bright red light. And D. A red light produces more photoelectrons than a green light. Okay. Now, photoelectrons, first of all, let's explain what photoelectrons simply means. Photoelectrons 
are emitted electrons the electrons which are emitted when light ray hits metal a metal surface or hits metallic surface now what this um, this emitted electrons are called the photoelectrons and this phenomenon is known to call the photoelectric what emission that's photoelectricity and has been applied in our various ways, various life now photoelectrons are actually what emitted electrons and this photoelectrons has kinetic energy the kinetic energy of photoelectrons that is the kinetic energy of emitted electrons the kinetic energy ke is independent that is do not depend it do not depend on the intensity do not depend on the intensity of the incident light do not depend on the intensity of the incident light and uh, you know if you look at option a option a says a faint green light now this is talking about the intensity produces photoelectron with less kinetic energy than a bright light red light now this option is already what invalid because they are talking about intensity here faint green light and bright red light and kinetic energy do not what depend on intensity kinetic energy ke only depends on it depends on frequency of the incident light or the wavelength of the incident light. Now B says a red light releases a small number of electrons than a green light. Now the intensity of the incident light only affects the, the number of it only affects the number of electrons that are emitted. Now, like we know a red light has a higher intensity than a green light, and so therefore a red light is expected to give higher number of electrons than a green light. So therefore rendering this was option invalid. A red light will give what it will give a higher number it will give a higher number of electron and a green light so this question this option is wrong now C says a faint green light produces photoelectrons with greater kinetic energy than a bright red light now I said already that kinetic energy of these photoelectrons do not depend on the intensity at all do not depend on intensity now this is a red light produces more photoelectrons than a green light yes a red light which has higher wavelength higher frequency and higher um, speed or velocity or intensity than the green light we produce more photoelectrons than the green light so therefore option a option d is valid and is the correct answer to this one to this question Thank you and God bless you and subscribe to our channel for more videos. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics past question, question 35. The sketched graph above illustrates the heating curve of 0.02 kilogram of water. Determine the approximate value of the specific latent heat of vaporization of water. A. 2.25 times 10 raised power of 6 joule per kilogram. B. 4.17 times 10 raised power of 3 joule per kilogram. C. 2.00 times 10 raised power of 3 joule per kilogram. And D. 1.00 times 10 raised power of 3 joule per kilogram. Now, we are asked to find the specific latent heat of vaporization. Now, specific latency of vaporization is simply defined as the quantity of heat is defined as the quantity of heat required to change required to change the unit mass of a substance from its liquid at boiling point to vapor without a change in temperature without a change in temperature 
Now the question is telling us about the, what, the heating curve of water and like we know the boiling point of water is what 100 degree Celsius. So that means when we are to calculate our specific latency of vaporization, we will consider the temperature at what 100 degrees Celsius and Celsius whereby the entire liquid has been converted to vapor and this is the point where the what, entire liquid has been converted to vapor and the corresponding heat applied in joules is what is 53 the heat h is what 53 times 10 raised to the power of 3 joules now the mass given to us is 0 0.02 kilogram and our specific latency of vaporization is given as l now l is given as h all over m this is derived from the formula heat is equal to mass times what specific latency of vaporization so we are now have that specific latency of vaporization l is equal to what the heat all over the mass given and this is equal to 53 times 10 raised to the power of 3 which is 53,000 all over 0 0.02 and this is equal to 2.25 times 10 raised to the power of 6 joule per kilogram and this is option a so option a is the correct answer to this question so this is the specific latency of vaporization of water thank you and god bless you and subscribe to the channel for more videos hello good day and welcome i will be answering waski 2020 physics pass question question 36 in a hydraulic press the force f applied is related to the diameter of the cylinder by a f is directly proportional to the square of the diameter b f is directly proportional to the diameter d c the force f is inversely proportional to what to the diameter and d the force f is inversely proportional to the square of the diameter now in a hydraulic press in a hydraulic press the pascal principle is what is applied in a hydraulic press the pascal principle is applied and in this pascal principle the force f is directly proportional to the what to the area the force f is directly proportional to the what to the area of the cylinder or the area of the container now let's take for instance you have something like this you have something like this now this is a bigger cylinder a smaller cylinder with piston like this let's assume this is a piston and this is also a this is a bigger cylinder with its piston now you see that what the force that will be applied here is what is directly proportional to the what to the area of this cylinder that is the force here now when force is applied here because of the larger area of this what of this cylinder here the force will what the force here will increase now this is a typical example of a what hydraulic press hydraulic press now since we know that what the area of this what of this cylinder is as a result of its radius and its radius can be used to get what the diameter we can also say that what that the force of this hydraulic press is directly proportional to the what to the diameter of this cylinder because the more the cylinder the, the more the diameter of the cylinder the greater the radius and likewise the greater the what the area and the greater the area the greater the force so therefore the force in a hydraulic press is directly proportional to the what to the diameter of the cylinder of this hydraulic press and that is option b option b so option b is the answer to this question thank you and god bless you and sure subscribe to our channel for more videos hello good day and welcome i will be answering waski 2020 physics past question question 37 
in an electric circuit an inductor in Dr. 0.5 Henry and, and resistance 50 ohms is connected to an alternating current source of frequency 60 Hz. Calculate the impedance of the circuit A 50 ohms, B 150.5 ohms, C 105.0 ohms and D 1950.1 ohms. So, we are asked to find the, what, the impedance of this circuit. And like we know, impedance is the, what, is the total opposition to the flow of current offered by the inductor, inductor, the resistor and the capacitor. But in this circuit, the capacitor is not what involved. So we have to find the impedance involving the inductor and the resistor. So the inductor has an inductance of 0 0.5 Henry and the resistance of 50 ohms. Now, the formula to find the impedance Z is equal to the square root of R square, that's the resistance square, plus the square of what? Of the inductive reactance, XL, the square of inductive reactance. Now we have R to be equal to 50 ohms. Then XL, inductive reactance, is not known. And inductive reactance, XL, is equal to 2 pi FL. Now this L here is the what is the inductance. F here is the frequency. So we can see XL inductive reactance is equal to 2 multiplied by 22 all over 7, which is the pi times the frequency 60 multiplied by the what the inductance 0 0.5. Now from this we we'll have that what we we'll have that the inductive reactance XL is equal to 1320 all over 7, and this is equal to 188.6 ohms. So this is the inductive reactance. So we can now solve for the impedance, which is equal to the square root of R square, that's 50 square, plus 188.6 square. Now when you do this with your calculator, you have that what the impedance Z is equal to 195.0 ohms. So this is the what impedance for this AC circuit. And this is option C. 195.0 ohms. Thank you and God bless you. And should subscribe to our channel for more videos. Hello, good day and welcome. I'll be answering Waski 2020 physics past question, question 38. Which of the following statements correctly explains why a total solar eclipse? would be seen by people on only a small portion of the Earth's surface. A. Moon is larger in diameter than the Earth. B. Earth is larger in diameter than the Moon. C. Earth revolves around the Sun. And D. Earth is larger in diameter than the Moon. Now, eclipse. Eclipse simply occurs when the Moon, when the Moon, the Sun, and the Earth are on what's are on a straight line. We see what an eclipse has occurred. Now we have what the solar eclipse and the lunar eclipse. But the question here is concerned with what with the solar eclipse. Now an eclipse can either be total or partial. It is either total or partial what eclipse. Now the question is asking us about a total solar eclipse. Now in a solar eclipse, the moon stays between the words. the moon stays between the sun and the earth let's say for instance you have the sun this is the sun now you have the moon and then you have the earth now this is the earth you will see that only a small portion of the earth will be affected by what by the total solar eclipse because the moon here will be blocking what the rays of light from the sun to this particular part of the earth but other parts of the earth like this part and this part we what we experience partial we experience partial solar eclipse but this part here we experience what a total solar eclipse 
now the question is asking us that why is it that just a small portion of the earth experienced total solar eclipse now if you look at it you notice that what the diameter of the moon is smaller compared to the diameter of the earth and that is why only a small portion of the earth is affected by what a total solar eclipse the diameter of the earth diameter of it is equal to 12,756 kilometer approximately and the diameter of the moon diameter of moon is equal to 3,476 kilometer approximately now you see that what the diameter of the moon is smaller compared to the what, diameter of the earth and that is why in total a total co uh, solar eclipse only affects what a smaller portion of the earth's surface because the moon is not as big as the earth now the answer to this question from what i just explained is option d earth is larger in diameter than the moon and this is the answer to the question because in a solar eclipse the moon stands between the what the sun and the earth and because of the low the larger diameter of the earth than the moon we see that what only a small portion of the earth is actually affected by this total solar eclipse but the other parts might experience what a partial solar eclipse or no eclipse at all so option d is the answer to this question thank you and god bless you ensure subscribe to the channel for more videos Good day and welcome. I will be answering WASCI 2020 physics past question, question 39. Water waves have a wavelength of 3.6 cm and speed of 18 cm per second in deep water. If the waves enter shallow water with wavelength of 2.0 cm, calculate the speed of the wave in the shallow water. A. 0.4 cm per second b 2.5 cm per second c 10 cm per second and d 10.8 cm per second so we're given that a water wave has a wavelength of 3.6 cm and speed of 18 cm per second in deep water so in deep water in deep water we have that the velocity that the speed of the wave is equal to 18 centimeter per second we have that the wavelength lambda is equal to 3.6 centimeter now we know that the frequency of a wave is always what constant irrespective of where this wave is going so that is the frequency of a water wave is always what constant so now for us to find the speed of the wave in the shallow water we have to find the frequency first and we can only find the frequency using the parameters of the wavelength and the speed in the deep water and we know that v is equal to f lambda now f frequency is equal to v all over lambda that is the velocity or the speed of the water wave all over the wavelength so we therefore have that f frequency is equal to 18 all over 3.6 and this is equal to 5 hertz or you can call it per second so we've gotten the frequency now in shallow water in shallow water since we know that the frequency is always what the frequency of the wave remains the same it is constant we have that the frequency f in shallow water is equal to 5 hertz also we have that the wavelength now lambda in shallow water is 2.0 centimeter now we are asked to find the word the speed of the wave in shallow water that is v is equal to f lambda and this is equal to 5 multiplied by 2 which is equal to 10 centimeter per second so 10 centimeter per second is the speed of the wave in the shallow water and that is option c option c is the answer Thank you and God bless you. Ensure to subscribe to our channel for more videos. Good day and welcome. I will be answering WASCI 2020 physics past question, question 40. An AC generator can be converted into a DC electric motor by replacing the A slip rings with a split ring and connecting a battery 
B. Split ring with a slip ring and connecting a battery. C. AC with DC source and connecting slip rings. And D. AC with DC source and connecting split rings. So the question is asking us that for an AC generator to be converted to a DC electric motor, the following things has to be put in place. Now, an electric motor an electric motor is an electric device that converts <coughs> electrical energy electrical energy into mechanical energy that's an electric motor now this electric motor has various parts one of the parts which is very important is the armature it has an armature it has a powerful magnet that produces was the powerful magnetic field a commutator a commutator consisting of what split rings consisting of split rings and then it has two carbon brushes two carbon brushes now an AC generator, alternating current generator, is a device that converts mechanical energy, mechanical energy into electrical energy. Does the opposite of um, a DC electric motor. Now, this AC generator has what we call the slip rings. It consists of the slip rings. Now, in converting an AC generator to a DC electric motor, these slip rings have to be replaced with a split ring. Remember, I said a, an electric motor is made up of split rings. That is, the commutator, commutator of an electric motor is made up of split rings. So, therefore, you have to what, replace these slip rings with the split rings. This is the only difference between what this generator and the electric motor. And also, replacing the alternating current with a what with a direct current that is replacing the ac current with a direct current so these are the two major things required for the conversion of a generator ac generator to an electric motor so therefore the answer to this question is option d that is the ac source will be replaced with a dc source and then the slip rings will be replaced with what with the split ring which is the component of an electric motor so option d is the answer to this question Thank you and God bless you. Make sure to subscribe to our channel for more videos. Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics past question, question 41. A ray of light travels obliquely from a less dense medium to a denser medium. Which of the following statements is true above the light? A. The wavelength of the light increases in the second medium. B. The speed of the light increases in the second medium. C. The light refracts towards the normal. And D. There is a change in the frequency of the light. Now, when a ray of light travels from a less dense medium, let's assume the dense, less dense medium is air. And then the denser medium is glass. So we have something like this. Let's assume this is our rectangular glass block. Now this is air and this is glass, the denser medium. Now let's assume we have a normal ray. Let's call this a normal ray. An area of light la passes obliquely from the less dense medium, which is the air, to the denser medium, which is the glass. Now it will be observed that this ray here is known as the incident ray. We call it the incident ray and this angle is the angle of incidence angle of incidence now as this ray of light passes from a less dense medium which is the air to a denser medium which is glass this ray of light was we bend towards the normal it will bend towards the normal so that the angle will be lower than towards the angle of incidence now this phenomenon is what we call refraction refraction occurs when what light rays bend that is change in direction of what of the ray of light as it's passing what different media of different densities 
now it is said that this re this light ray has been what has been refracted towards the normal and we call this the what the refracted ray and this angle we call it the angle of refraction angle of refraction now if it was that the ray of light was traveling from a denser medium which is the glass to a less dense medium now it will what it will move far away from the what from the normal that is the ray will move away from the normal but because it is moving from a less dense medium to a denser medium it is what it is moving towards the normal that means the ray of light has been refracted because what there is a change in density of the medium now the wavelength won't be affected the speed won't be affected neither will the frequency be affected but the direction of this wave will be affected and that is what refraction and the ray of light because it is moving from a less dense less dense to a denser medium it will move or the ray of light will move or will be refracted towards the normal ray and this is the normal ray and that is why the angle of refraction is lower than the angle of incidence when ray of light moves from a less dense medium to a denser medium so the answer to this question is option c the light refracts towards the normal. That's the answer to this question. Thank you and just subscribe to our channel for more videos. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics past question, question 43. Which of the following statements about the process of melting of a solid are true? The temperature of the solid will 1. Remain steady until melting starts 2. Keep rising until melting starts 3. Remain steady as melting proceeds 4. Keep rising as melting proceeds And that is it. Now option A says 2 and 3 are correct. Option B says 3 and 4 only are correct. Option C says 1, 3 and one, 2 and 3 only is correct. And option D says 2, 3 and 4 only is correct. Now when heat is applied to a solid certain changes occur but before these changes occur there must be a, an increase in temperature in this solid now let's represent this graphically using a graph let's assume this is the temperature and here is the time in minutes and this is the word temperature in degrees celsius in degrees celsius now let's assume heat is applied to a solid now when heat is applied to a solid this heat in the solid will continue the temperature of the solid will continue to increase until it gets to a point the melting point of this solid where what this solid begins to what melt into liquid now our this melting point let's call it the melting point at this melting point the temperature do not increase the temperature will be, remains what the same it remains uniform until uh, the entire solid has changed towards liquid and then it becomes the temperature again begins to increase the temperature then begins to what to increase so at this point we call this point the what the melting we call it the melting process because at this point this is where the solid changes to liquid so it is a melting process and at this point the temperature remains what's constant it does not change but before it reaches the melting point what happens the temperature increases so when heat is applied when heat is applied to the solid when heat is applied temperature what increases the temperature increases until the solid begins to melt until the solid begins to melt now at this melting point that is when the melting starts the temperature remains what's constant it remains steady so during melting process temperature remains steady now from this you see that what statement 2 is correct that is keep rising until melting starts it keeps rising until the melting starts so uh, statement 2 is correct now statement 4 and uh, statement 3 says 
remains steady as melting proceeds which is also correct it remains steady as the melting proceed now one says it remains steady until melting starts it is wrong and four says keep rising as melting proceed which is wrong so the answer to this question is option what option a is the answer to this question that is statements two and three only are correct thank you and should subscribe to our channel for more videos Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics pass question, question 44. A diver steps off a diving platform that is 10 meters above the water. If there is no air resistance during the fall, there will be a decrease in the diver's A. Gravitational potential energy, B. Total mechanical energy, C. Kinetic energy, and D. Momentum. So let's assume the level of the water is the ground level. Let's assume that is the ground level. Now, when a diver dives from a platform, it is expected that was due to gravity, the driver wards will fall. Now, during this fall, the height of the driver wards decreases. The height decreases. Now, since the height decreases, we must look for a term or a concept here that is also what's affected when height wards decreases. And like we know, option A, which is gravitational potential energy. Gravitational potential energy, which is described as the work done, the work done in raising in raising a mass m from ground level or from ground surface or from the ground to a level or to a height above the ground to a height above the ground now this gravitational potential energy depends what on heights the gravitational potential energy depends on heights meaning that gravitational potential energy is directly proportional to heights and this can be seen from the what from the expression gravitational potential energy is given as mgh so now when this diver dives and begins to what fall during this fall height what decreases like i said and due to the decrease in the heights there will be a decrease in the what in the gravitational potential energy because gravitational potential energy is directly proportional to the heights like i told you i say it depends on heights so due to the decrease in heights there will be a decrease in what in gravitational potential energy and that is option a which is the answer to this question thank you and just subscribe to our channel for more videos Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics pass question, question 45. Which of the following actions would increase the electric force between two positively charged particles? A. Decreasing the mass of the particles. B. Decreasing the distance between the particles. C. Uh, increasing the distance between the particles. And D. Increasing the mass of the particles. Now, according to Coulomb's law, according to Coulomb's law, we state that the electric force between two electrons or two charged particles is directly proportional, that is F, is directly proportional to the product of the charges, that is Q1 and Q2, and also inversely proportional to the square of the distance between these two charges. Now that is what Coulomb's law. Now the question says which of the following action would increase the electric force between two positively charged particles now this electric force between the these two positively charged particles can only be increased that is increase in this force can only be gotten when the what the charges or the quantity of the charges is increased that is when there's an increase in the quantity of the charge and also when there's a what a decrease in the distance between the charges or particles now this is because what the force is inversely proportional the electric force is inversely what proportional to the square of the distance between these two charges so therefore decreasing the distance we what increase the force and increasing the distance we decrease the force and the question says what increase the electric force so therefore decreasing the distance would increase the electric force and that is option b decreasing the distance between the particles as stated by 
columns low. Thank you and just subscribe to our channel for more videos. Good day and welcome. I will be answering one skit twenty twenty physics past question question forty six. A luminous object is one that a gives off dim blue green light only in the dark, b gives out light of its own, c shines by reflected light only, and d glows only in the presence of light. Now a luminous object a luminous object is one is an object or is one that generates and emits lights themselves. So luminous objects are objects that has the ability to what to generate its own light and also what emits this light. Examples of this luminous objects include the sun, the stars. You see that the sun and the stars has the ability to what to generate their own light and also what to emit this light. So therefore, a luminous object is such that can give out its own light, and that is option B. Thank you, and sure subscribe to our channel for more videos. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics past question, question 47. Which of the following units is not fundamental? A meter, B kilogram, C joule, and D candela. So we are asked for a unit that is not a fundamental unit. Now, first of all, what are fundamental units? Fundamental units are units, or we call them basic units of fundamental quantities. Fundamental quantities. And like we know, fundamental quantities are the what are basic quantities from which other quantities can be derived. So in other words, we can say fundamental units are units from which other units are derived. Now these fundamental units are units of fundamental quantities. Example is the length of the fundamental quantity. And the unit, the fundamental unit is what? Meter. Likewise, you have the what? You have the temperature. The unit is what? Kelvin. We have the luminous intensity. Luminous intensity. The unit is what? Is candela. We have mass. The unit is what? Kilogram. Now all these are what? All these are fundamental quantity with the fundamental unit. Now the question says we should pick an option which is not a fundamental unit. That means the, the, the unit is a derived unit. Now from this you see that option A is a fundamental unit. The unit of length. Likewise B, kilogram is a fundamental unit. The unit of mass. And D, candela is a fundamental unit. The unit of what? Luminous intensity. Now C, option C is a derived unit. And this derived unit is a unit of what? Of work or energy. So joule is a unit of work or energy. And like we know, work and energy are derived what? They are derived quantities. They are derived quantity. Now, joule can also be expressed as kilogram meter square per second square. So kilogram meter square per second square. This is the representation of joules, and this is to tell you that what joules is derived from the kilogram, the fundamental unit, mass, fundamental unit, and second, which is fundamental unit. So therefore, joule is the answer to this question because joule is a derived what a derived unit. It is not a fundamental unit. Thank you very much. And sure subscribe to our channel for more videos. Hello, good day and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics pass question, question 48. The vacuum between the double walls of a thermoflax reduces the heat loss through A. Conduction and radiation B. Convection and conduction C. Radiation only and D. Conduction only Now, they say the vacuum between what the double wall of a thermoflax. Now, what is a thermoflax? A thermoflax A thermoflax or what is known as a vacuum flux has a, a double it has a double walled glass vessel 
a double walled glass sword vessel with a vacuum between the walls that is there is a vacuum between the walls now this vacuum the vacuum is towards is to reduce heat loss or gain by conduction or convection so the vacuum between the double wall of a thermal flux is actually to reduce heat loss via what via conduction or convection and like you know conduction is just the word conduction is loss of heat via what heating a material medium where convection is a loss of heat in what in fluids so the answer to this question is option b convection and conduction convection and conduction thank you and god bless you and should subscribe to our channel for more videos Hello, good day, and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics pass question, question 29. In photoelectric effects, the number of electrons emitted per second from a metallic surface is proportional to the A. Intensity of the incident radiation, B. Frequency of the incident radiation, C. Energy of the incident radiation, and D. Work function of the metal. Now, in photoelectric effects, in a photoelectric effect, when light rays, when light rays, or light falls on a metallic surface falls on a metallic surface electrons are emitted electrons are emitted now these emitted electrons are what we call the words we call them the photo electrons these electrons that are emitted are called the photo electrons now the maximum kinetic energy of these emitted electrons the maximum kinetic energy that is the maximum ke of the emitted electrons or the photo electrons is independent of the intensity of the incident radiation that is it do not depend it do not depend on the words intensity of the incident radiation so therefore making what option a invalid so it is independent it does not depend on the what intensity of the incident radiation but is proportional but is proportional to the frequency it is proportional to either the frequency or wavelength wavelength of this words of this radiation or the incident words light so therefore the photoelectric effect the number of electrons emitted per second which is the words energy of this or electrons from a metallic surface is proportional to the words to the frequency it's proportional to the frequency or to the wavelength of this incident light and from the option here frequency of the incident radiation is given to us so we pick it as our answer because it is proportional to either the frequency or the wavelength and since the frequency is given to us we pick frequency as our answer so the answer to this question is option b it do not depend on the intensity at all so the answer is what option b the frequency of the incident radiation thank you and god bless you and subscribe to our channel for more videos Good day and welcome. I will be answering Waski 2020 physics pass question. Question 50. When two cells of negligible internal resistance and equal EMF, that is electromotive force, denoted by E1 and E2, are connected in parallel, the combined EMF is given by A. E is equal to E1 plus E2. B. 1 over E is equal to 1 over E1 plus 1 over E2. C. E is equal to E1, which is equal to E2. And D. E is equal to E1 all over E2. Now, we're given that two cells of negligible internal resistance are and equal EMF denoted by E1 and E2. Equal EMF, meaning that the electromotive force of the first cell 
A1 is equal to the electromotive force of the second cell E2 and they are connected in parallel that's parallel was connection now it says the combined emf is given by now when cells or when cells are connected in parallel when cells are connected in parallel now the emf of this cell e the total emf passing was through this word circuit is equal to each of the emf that is the total emf e is equal to the what to the emf of the first cell which is also equal to the emf of the second cell but if it was to be in what series connection if they were connected in series then the emf will be the total emf will be equal to what the sum of the first emf that the emf of the first cell that is electromotive force of the first cell plus the electromotive force of the second cell but because it is in a parallel connection the total emf is equal to the word individual emf and that is why the emf of the first cell is equal to the word emf of the second cell because they are connected in what in parallel connection so the answer to this question is option c e is equal to e1 which is equal to e2 because they are in what parallel connection thank you and god bless you and subscribe to our channel for more videos